Welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 65, The Third Republic, Part 5, Popular Front in Power. This week, a big thank you goes out to Matthew for the donation and to Daniel for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, where they now get access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special patron-only episodes released roughly every month. You can find out more at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. The French elections of late April and early May 1936 resulted in a majority for the Popular Front Coalition, with 378 seats in the Chamber of Deputies, versus just 236 for the opposition. Within the Popular Front, the SFIO would have the largest number of deputies at 149, then the Radicals at 110, and then the Communists at 72. The rest of the seats were made up of smaller leftist parties and then some independent centrists who voted with the Popular Front. The resulting government was formed with a socialist at its head, Leon Blum. He was the first socialist prime minister of France and also the first Jew. This government would be in place for just over a year, and during that time it would attempt to both satisfy its supporters with the social reforms that were part of the socialist and communist political platform, while also maintaining support from the center parties that were a critical part of the Popular Front coalition. During this episode, we will track the developments during this year of Popular Front control, from those social reforms to foreign policy, relations between the government and the army, and finally we'll cover the fall of this government. Shortly after the Popular Front took office, something that might surprise you happened. France would experience one of the largest series of strikes during the interwar period. Over the course of the month of June, there would be over 12,000 worker strikes, and they would involve 1.8 million workers. This was right after the Popular Front, theoretically a government sympathetic to their interests, had taken control. These strikes would frequently seem quite different than what had happened previously, and often took the form of occupation of workplaces. They would then make demands, which were frequently not radical or extreme, and then they would occupy the workplace until those demands were met. One of the workers from the Renault factory, or from a Renault factory, would explain why this path of occupation was chosen. Quote, Our tactic is to occupy and hold out at any cost, as in a besieged city. Outside the factory, we would be nothing more than unemployed, incapable of maintaining our unity against the company union and fascists. Over the first week of June, the number of workplaces under worker control continued to increase. In Paris, there would just be a handful on the 1st of June, but by the end of the 2nd, there would be over 150. This raised fears of a revolution in the making, with that possibility being seen as good or bad, depending on who you were in France at this time. All of this happening in the weeks after the Popular Front government formed is attributable to the fact that almost all of these actions were driven and sustained by the workers themselves. There were attempts by the unions to control the strikes, There was even, you know, work done by the government to try and control them, and even just stop them in some cases, but these efforts were unsuccessful. The strikes that were prompted and supported by the unions, which did occur, were soon totally out of their control as well. It really set the stage for the coming year, with the workers finally having brought a socialist government into power, wanting the government to make immediate and drastic changes. They wanted to radically upend the relationship between employers and workers, and they wanted those changes to happen quickly. There would be some changes made, easily the most famous being the 40-hour workweek, which was introduced in France, and the concept of the 40-hour workweek had been a talking point by the French socialists for quite some time, and beyond just the reduction in maximum time that a single person could be expected to work in one week, there were other benefits as well. The first related to the unemployment numbers with the idea being that if a single person could only work so many hours, the rest of the hours would have to be filled by somebody else, which would naturally reduce the total number of unemployed people. This in turn, again in theory, would increase the demand for many goods, as it would provide more people with the ability to purchase those goods. These were the reasons why the Popular Front introduced the 40-hour limit, but it would also have its downsides. For example, some businesses simply closed up shop for a period during the week instead of hiring more people to fill those hours. It would also cause some problems once rearmament got started in later years, but we'll discuss that later on. We have to be careful with how we judge the introduction of the 40-hour work week in all instances, though, because it was not really in place in a real universal way for that long of a time. 
It did not become a widely adopted and enforced policy until March 1937, and then by the beginning of 1938, it was already under attack, with large exceptions being carved out for various industries, especially around rearmament. This relatively short period of adoption makes it difficult to draw conclusions about the benefits and downsides of the change. What does seem clear is that the socialist economists were probably underestimating how much of an increase in labor costs the change would cause, while also having an overly optimistic view of how quickly it would cause the economy to recover. The rate of recovery was crucial because the rise in overall costs of labor was expected, with the theory being that the benefits would outweigh these costs. The introduction of the 40-hour workweek also did not properly take into account the effects it would have on skilled industries, where it was not just possible to take an unemployed worker and directly insert them into the position. Such skilled industries took months and even years to bring their worker pool up to the necessary level after it was cut by the 40-hour workweek. A key driver in the 40-hour workweek reform and in other economic reforms made by the Popular Front were the Popular Front's economic sort of platform or beliefs. The socialist policies around economics were attempts to solve what they saw as the primary problem with the French economy during the mid-1930s, which was underconsumption. There simply were not enough people with enough purchasing power to make the economy work. Or to quote Bloom, quote, guided by one overriding idea, to use the power of the state to increase the purchasing power of the masses. The root cause of this problem which fit nicely into the general socialist belief system, was claimed to be the one-sided wealth transfer between the workers and the employers, which was something inherent to capitalism. By reversing some of this wealth transfer, the socialists believed that the entire French economy would be far healthier. To try and ensure that the proper economic moves were made, most of the important ministerial positions were filled by socialists. This would result in the aforementioned 40-hour workweek as well as reversals of previous government policies around deflation decrees and and hard caps on government spending. Instead, there would be attempts to increase wages, as well as public works programs that were put in place which involved quite a bit of government spending. The results of these policies were mostly negative, but there was once again an important caveat. In September 1936, the decision would be made to devalue the franc, uh, something that had been resisted by French governments since the 1920s, out of fears of inflation. The decision to devalue meant that it is challenging to look at the effects of the Popular Front policies during the period before September 1936, because they only had a limited window of being in effect before the franc was devalued, at which point there are so many other economic factors to consider. What we do know is that in the period between July and September, industrial production fell slightly and unemployment increased. But again, it's hard to draw conclusions here because it's very possible that no economic changes could outweigh the problems caused by the continued resistance to devaluation. So we should probably just talk about how that devaluation ended up happening. Devaluation had been a hot-button topic in French politics for all of the years after other nations started to devalue in 1931. Refusing to devalue had been a pivotal part of French economic policy and for many years it was political suicide to even suggest it. This did begin to change after 1933 and 1934, and in fact Bloom would himself say that maybe, possibly, devaluation was desirable as early as April 1934. By the time that the Popular Front came into power, resistance to the very idea of devaluation had greatly weakened, and during the summer of 1936 it began to be discussed as an inevitability. Focus shifted not to whether or not it should be done, but how it should be accomplished. The largest concern was that if the French just announced that they were devaluing their currency, there would be a reaction from the United States and Britain. With how large their economies were, and how important they were to the French economy, these countermeasures needed to be avoided. The French financial attaché in London, Emmanuel Monique, uh, advised that both of the nations should be contacted and negotiations should be started. He also believed that the Americans were the most important part of those discussions, saying, quote, We would be wasting time by starting with Great Britain. We also lose an opportunity to make our case in the best possible light with President Roosevelt. I know the President of the United States well enough to believe that he will say yes, and once President Roosevelt has said yes, the British government cannot say no. 
The final decision to pursue the devaluation path was made on September 8th, and a note would be sent to both London and Washington to that effect. It stated that it was the intention of the French government to move the franc to a new exchange level, but both parties proved to be unwilling to enter into any formal agreements, and instead favored simple non-binding agreements that did not limit their actions. Even these simple agreements were enough, though, and on October 1st, the franc would be officially devalued. It would still not be a floating currency uh, that would come later, but instead simply reduce the value of the franc from its previous 65.6 milligrams of gold to 43 and 49 milligrams. The changes this brought about were almost instant, and by the end of the year, industrial production figures had increased and unemployment had dropped to 1934 levels. French prices were also coming into line with British prices for new goods, which freed up the French economy. Or, as one French economic historian would say, some excellent prospects were opening up for the French economy now that it had jumped over the gold fence holding it down. While the initial results of devaluation were good, shortly thereafter, the great enemy that had been the reason for so much resistance to devaluation began to rear its head, inflation. Inflation had been a major concern among advocates for the gold standard and deflationary policies, and France would begin to experience it in the wake of devaluation. During the first months of 1937, uh, inflation would continue, and there would even push the French government into crisis as the French gold reserves continued to drop. As inflation increased, almost all of the gains of the early months of devaluation suddenly began to disappear. Industrial production would begin to once again drop after March, and prices began to rise far faster than wages. This caused a spiral of gold reserve depletion, as increased prices resulted in more imports, which then drained reserves further. Eventually, but after the fall of the Popular Front, further devaluation would have to occur. In July 1937, the decision would be made to just let the franc float a bit, and this would be a de facto devaluation, which would then be put in place officially in May 1938, again an attempt to stabilize the French economy. During all of this period, the franc slipped drastically. In early 1937, a British pound was equal to 111 francs. By mid-1938, it was 175. Against the U.S. dollar, it would go from 15 francs in early 1936 to 37 in 1938. But there was good news. By 1938, the French import and export balance had, had greatly improved, and it's likely that the value of the franc was showing really strong signs for a really good 1939, which was, of course, derailed by events. Devaluation, the 40-hour work week, were among many decisions that the Bloom government would have to make, and they were in the unenviable position of making nobody happy with what they were doing. From the left, they were constantly criticized for not doing enough, while from others, they were criticized for doing too much. For example, one area where they would be criticized for not doing enough would be in the area of the civil service. From the left, the unwillingness of the government to make wide changes to who was in the French civil service would be heavily criticized. It meant that there were many within the civil service that, while not actively resisting any government reforms, were perhaps not as vigorous as they could have been in implementing them. Instead of this more conciliatory approach, those on the left wanted a wide-scale replacement of the civil service, while those on the right claimed that any such action would be an abuse of power. Another area where the Popular Front and its changes were non-existent or confused were around colonial policies. The problem in the case of this topic was generally disagreement among the Popular Front parties about the best course of action. Some wanted to maintain the status quo when it came to two French colonies. For others, the, they wanted a more concrete path to independence for the colonies, while others wanted an immediate shift to freedom for all of France's colonial possessions. In this case, the disagreements would lead to complete inaction. Colonial policy would not be the only item on which the constituent parts of the Popular Front found themselves in disagreement. Then those disagreements and the tension that they would cause would grow after the Popular Front came to power. As would be so often the case, the unity that had brought the coalition to power would begin to erode almost immediately as all of the problems in France were not quickly solved, and some appeared to be getting worse. <laughs> 
While the domestic situation was improving in some ways and not improving in others, the Popular Front also had to be greatly concerned about French foreign policy. In this area, Bloom was well positioned, as he had been seen as the expert on the socialist foreign policy sort of platform before the creation of the Popular Front. Unfortunately, he would inherit a very problematic foreign relations situation that was mostly incoherent and also disappointing. We will cover various areas of those relations in a somewhat random order here. After the First World War, relations with nations in Eastern Europe had been seen as essential to replacing the previous alliance with the Russian Empire. However, by the mid-1930s, these relations continued to be underwhelming. They would continue to deteriorate after the French decided not to react strongly to the German remilitarization of the Rhineland. The largest problem was simply that the nations in Eastern Europe began to strongly question whether or not they were really going to get anything out of good relations with France. These questions came up against the obvious and apparent growth of power in Italy and Germany, who were not yet working closely together but were individually still a concern. If the French had been very proactive in this area of foreign policy, it might have been possible to make positive developments happen, but instead the French government would continue to delay. This meant that when nations like Romania wanted to sign a mutual assistance pact with France and other nations, backing would not be provided by Paris. This would set up many of the nations in Eastern Europe to move into German or Italian relationships, with nations signing non-aggression or, or trade agreements with Germany and Italy in the last years before the war. Speaking of Italy, as we discussed before, relations with Italy were not good in the mid-1930s. The events that began to happen in Spain did nothing to help these relations. With the Spanish Civil War beginning and heavy Italian involvement being a well-known part of that conflict, France was kind of stuck in a bad place. Also, in comparison to earlier French governments, there was less emphasis on Italian relations by the Popular Front leaders, who believed that while the relations with Italy were certainly important, they were not as critical for French security. This was combined with the situation in Spain to, to cause problems. The Popular Front was a socialist, a leftist government. And so was the Republic in Spain. And here was Italy supporting Franco and the Nationalists. It just didn't look good, it didn't work well, and it really hurt their relations. This could have been counteracted by good relations with other nations, and especially with the Soviet Union. But relations with the Soviets would also be disappointing. The Soviet leaders were quite keen to establish more concrete relations with France, but there was always some hesitancy in Paris. The primary concerns were that the Soviets actually wanted a war to happen in Western Europe to weaken the Western European powers. Another concern was that the Soviet Red Army was not actually worth very much when it came to a military alliance. Many of these concerns were amplified and confirmed by a report published in October 1936 which concerned some Soviet military maneuvers that had been overseen by French observers. The report would say, quote, not only would a war between France and Germany have the advantage of leaving almost all of the Soviet forces outside the conflict, owing to the absence of a Russo-German border, uh, it would leave the USSR the arbiter of a drained and exhausted Europe. End quote. On these issues, there was once again strong disagreements among the Popular Front parties, with the communists and many socialists believing that relations with Russia were essential, while those closer to the center pushed back the strongly against any changes. Unfortunately, such disagreements simply meant that the Popular Front leaders chose what would in retrospect be the worst of all options, which was to do pretty much nothing. In his book In Command of France, French Foreign Policy and Military Planning 1933-1940, Robert Young would have this to say about the Popular Front's foreign policy. Quote, Without putting too sharp an edge on it, the fact remains that under his surveillance, this being the foreign minister, French diplomacy made no worthwhile advances to either Russia or Italy, at least partially compromised itself over the Spanish Civil War, stood impotent before Belgium's run to cover of neutrality, and neither advanced nor retreated in, the Eastern, in Eastern Europe that had been shaken by the restraint shown by France in March 1936. End quote. When it came to relations with the French military, in general things could be classified as reasonable. There were many problems with the French military during this period, a lack of coordination between the various military arms, a lack of urgency around improving their performance, 
and material deficits were all on the leading edge of that list. But these were in no way caused by the Popular Front, and over the Popular Front period, Bloom would stick to his general pledge to provide for the French military a reasonable level of support and resources. This support for the French military meant that during the period before, during, and after the Popular Front, the military was able to remain mostly insulated from other changes in France. There were some decisions that would have to be made, though, uh, particularly around rearmament, which was becoming a larger concern after 1936, as German rearmament efforts first became known and then continued to expand. Rearmament was, in general, a problem for the Bloom government because it really wanted to spend money on social programs, uh, both public works and other social spending. However, the demands of rearmament would be forced to take priority. In 1936, the first real rearmament plan for the French military would be put in place, with the French army given 14 billion francs for those efforts. However, they were forced into a position of having to upgrade many industries, especially those that had become technologically backwards in France, like the aviation industry. Over the course of the next four years, most of the money would be given to infantry and artillery rearmament, reinforcing the defensive nature of the army. It was also a little easier from a raw materials perspective, with the French having to import many of the key raw materials needed for a modern mechanized army. Shortly after the end of the Bloom government, there would also be problems with finding enough people to work in the armament industries, with French unemployment reaching new lows. The support for rearmament went beyond just direct defense requirements as well, and also was part of the Popular Front's effort to make France a more attractive ally. The stronger the French military was, the better it would be at supporting others, and the less support it would need from those other nations. Rearmament is a story that is just really getting started during the Popular Front government, and we'll discuss it in more detail in later episodes. The end of the first Popular Front government would be related to rearmament, but not caused by it. In June 1937, with the financial crisis continuing to deepen due to the continued import and export imbalance, the government requested decree powers to make economic changes, a power that had been granted to previous governments in similar situation. In this case, the Senate rejected it. When this happened, there were many options available to Bloom and the government. For example, they could have dissolved the government, they could have resigned and sought a new election to force the Senate to change its position. However, support from the left had been continually strained by the policies of the government, as we've mentioned during this episode. Because of this, in the end, Bloom would simply resign and the government would be replaced. Bloom would claim that he felt that this was the only way to avoid a possible constitutional crisis and a continual strain between the Senate and the government. He was unwilling to push into that kind of action, even if he would ass was assured of support from those on the left, which was questionable after the previous year in power. And so the Popular Front government, or the first Popular Front government, came to an end with something of a whimper. Later in the year, the destruction of unity on the left was very apparent at the Socialist Party meeting in Marseille. This resulted in physical altercations during debates. That's how heated things were. It was a disappointing end to a period of great unity. And while the socialists would be involved in later governments, they would even lead the next one and then have minor roles in those that followed, this first uh, popular front government was probably the one where they had a chance to make real changes, the real changes that they, they said that they wanted before they came to power. Other governments later, and governments they were involved in closer to the war, simply had so many other concerns that radical social change was simply not possible. At the time, Bloom would come under heavy criticism for not pushing for greater reforms that his supporters wanted, with many on the left believing that it was this hesitancy to make the changes that resulted in the fall of the government and the fragmentation of the left. However, this view probably undersells the importance of support from the center that the Popular Front enjoyed, and any real push for further changes, for greater reforms, in a way that many socialist supporters wanted, probably would have resulted in the complete evaporation of that support from the center, which probably would have resulted in the government falling anyway. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode for what will be our final episode on French politics during the 1930s, in which we will discuss French politics in 1938 and 1939 as war approached.